I think it's really important to be honest with people. And sometimes I think um, in organizations, uh, maybe there's gets something lost in the translation when, when, when organizations are telling the workers um, what they're seeking or what they should be seeking or what could happen. And I kept hearing a few things today and I just wanna be really clear because I think it's important to know this. Um, nobody is taking part B out. So part B is essential to the Dynamics decision and it is, it is the, the middle part of a test. So, um, so to believe, at least in this bill, <laughs> the one I'm carrying, um, Part B will not be taken out. So I, I just want to say that because that's not even a negotiated standpoint. What we've done on exemptions is this. We've taken workers who, first of all, historically, historically had certain aspects that made them in a different wage order in the labor code. Things like the ability to self-negotiate, right? They're setting their own rates. They have their own structure. Um, they, they are workers by and far that satisfy our test for, for salaried exempt workers. In other words, their, their salary is, is at least twice the minimum wage, meaning we're not worried if, uh, as much about overtime and, um, and rest periods and break periods. They, have all, they share these features. Um, they have the ability to negotiate for themselves. Their rates are not set. I think that's really important. Um, when rates are set by a master contractor, that means you're working for somebody um, for the most part. And, and I'll, I'll just, I, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I really want to talk to all the workers because I don't think this is understood. For example, we could look at cosmetology and that's an issue that we're going to work on in the next few weeks with um, hairstylists and, and nail salon owners. And there's a difference, and we all know this, if you go to your, your, your hairstylist and you, they're booking your appointment, they're renting a chair, they're setting the rates, there's not rates on the, on, on the wall that tell you how much they're charging. That means they're working for themselves, they're a small business, they're negotiating with you. If I'm working for a company where every haircut is $7 and that's already been decided and there's somebody else deciding when I, I'm going to schedule you and how often I'm there, that's, that's not an independent contractor. That doesn't sound or feel like a small business. And I, I want people to really think through what we're trying to do here. We're trying to ensure that people who are independent contractors understand and know not just that they have flexibility, but they have control over um, their workplace and how much frankly, they make. The idea of flexibility in, um, in Lyft drivers, and I know Lyft does a good job of, of with some drivers of bringing them here. Um, you know, I also had a story, and I'm sorry I'm taking too much time, but this is, for me, such an emotional issue. I was in the, the chair's uh, district on Friday, and, um, and I, I took an Uber of a driver who also drove for Lyft, and as I do every time I ask about about their situation and, and how they work. Um, and he was a single dad. He had four kids. And he said um, that he started driving uh, to supplement a part-time job. And at first, when it first came up, this was five, six years ago, he was actually making really good money. He said um, in the San Jose area, you know, if he worked, if he worked as a driver for 60 hours a week, which is a lot of work, um, that he could make uh, uh, close to two thousand dollars a week and he could actually you know get by and, and be able to take care of his four kids um he said over the time period what he saw is that ability to make that money went down and down and down as these two companies battled and that he is now um bringing home about a thousand dollars a week working 60 hours a week in san jose which is high cost living before taxes and then he has to figure out how to pay his taxes he has no health insurance he, his children are not insured um, he he has no safety net if he gets hurt on the job he doesn't have workers compensation he has no unemployment insurance if, if somehow he he loses that job and he explained to me the the fear the fear of um of Uber or Lyft or any tech company, app-based company of, of retaliating against his ability to earn money through that platform without explanation. They can drop a driver without explanation, in which case he is still a father of four kids living in San Jose without unemployment insurance and without his ability to even make his car payment. So I think we have to understand that, um, you know, it, we saw a lot of celebrations on Friday because the, the day this man told me the story, 
the day the man told me the story was the same day we saw Lyft celebrate becoming a, a company valued at $28 billion, billion with a B. That, yeah, that's innovation, that's great. But if you're a $24 billion company and you get on television and say, if you have to pay your workers minimum wage and provide workers compensation and, and overtime and, and paid sick leave and paid family leave, if you have to do these things that every other company in California is expected to do, that you cannot survive in the marketplace. I would venture to say this is not how capitalism is supposed to work. That that is then either fake value of a company, it means a lot of people are getting ripped off with stock, or they have a really bad business model that they can't even pay their workers, but somehow they can pay their stockholders um, who, who basically are investing in a company that they say, they say, they created the value is $28 billion a, a company. The same week, that workers had to go on strike because their per mileage fee was being cut. An investor was celebrating his $30,000 investment that became $120 million in one day. Something is wrong with the way we have allowed these companies to operate. And the people who pay are you and me. The people that pay are good companies like our limo services that pay their drivers correctly as employees. Us as taxpayers, last year we, we supplemented the earned income tax credit for independent contractors. That means that father of four is gonna get a tax credit paid by taxpayers while Lyft's, you know, celebrates their, their huge gains. A lot of people are getting rich and it's not the workers and it's at the cost of the taxpayers. It's time to level the playing field. It's time to be honest with workers. It's time to be honest um, with companies and let us work on the same ideas together and understand what we're trying to do here. So I thank you for letting me say that. I know that was off script, but. Um, okay, thank you. I respectfully ask for an I vote.